chapter number two. And we want to, uh, I hope and pray if anybody's in the parking lot listening to this, we have had some trouble with the sound system, uh, this and that. If I if I knew how to fix it, I would. I don't know anything, Brother Avery can tell you that. I don't know anything when it comes to the electronics, but I appreciate him and all that he does and and figuring out that thing. I just I just look at that uh, audio board back there and get scared and run away from it. And uh, so he can, he can, he can figure that thing out. But we have had some problems with that. If anybody's out in the parking lot, I appreciate you being here uh, with us as well. And maybe some that will be listening on the internet later. And so we're thankful for these ways that we have to stay connected. Uh, I want to look in Nehemiah chapter number 2. Uh, let's all stand and we want to read a few verses here and give us the thought that the Lord has laid on our heart. Think about going forward uh, from ending a year and going into another year. And a lot of times we think about resolutions and, you know, no doubt, I guess the timely message for now, for now is about, you know, res New Year's resolutions and different things like that. But I, I guess I would uh, think of it more as New Year's encouragements. Um, and uh, so let's begin reading verse number 11. It says, So I came to Jerusalem and was there three days. This is Nehemiah chapter number 2, verse number 11. And I arose in the night, I and a few men with me, neither told I any man what my God had put in my heart to do at Jerusalem. Neither was there any beast with me, save the beast that I rode upon went out by night by the gate of the valley, even before the dragon well and the dung port, and viewed the walls of Jerusalem, which were broken down, and the gates thereof were consumed with fire. Then I went on to the gate of the fountain to the king's pool, but there was no place for the beast that, I was, uh, that was under me to pass. So I went up in the night by the brook and viewed the wall and turned back and entered to the gate of the valley and so returned. And the rulers knew not whither I went nor what I did. Neither had I yet told it to the Jews nor to the priests nor to the nobles nor to the rulers nor to the rest that did the work. Then said I unto them, you see the distress that we are in, how Jerusalem lies waste the gates thereof are burned with fire. Come, let us build up the wall of Jerusalem, that we be no more reproached. Then I told them of the hand of my God, which was good upon me, as also the king's words that he had spoken unto me. And they said, Let us rise up and build. So they strengthened their hands for this good work. I will read verse number 18 again. Then I told them of the hand of my God, which was good upon me, as also the king's words that he had spoken unto me. And they said, Let us rise up and build. So they strengthened their hands for this good work. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, once again, God, we thank you, Lord, for the privilege, God, just to open up your word this morning. Thank you, Lord, for health and strength, Lord, to be here. And I pray, God, that you would keep us protected, Lord, from any disease or any harm, Lord. Lord God, we just realize, Lord, that each and every day, Lord, that we have, and Lord, each and every day that we have the ability to gather ourselves together is a blessing from you. God, I just ask, Lord, that we take full advantage of it. God, I pray, Lord, that the things, Lord, that uh, we we feel, and Lord, the, not just the things that we feel, but the things that we hear, the things that we see, and Lord, the things, Lord, that we experience today. God, I pray, Lord, that it be a life-changing experience, Lord, in our life. Lord, not just church as usual, but God, I pray, Lord, be a challenge to our hearts today. Lord, as we've already said, Lord, we think about the encouragement, Lord, ending this year and coming into a new year. God, we want to strive each and every day, Lord, to be a better Christian, better witness, a better life. Lord, knowing, Lord, that our days are few down here. God, I just ask, Lord, that you do that, not just in my life, but, Lord, in the lives of our church. God, that we could go forth from this place, Lord, into the mission field. Lord, be lights for you in a lost and dying world. Lord, we see, we hear the phrase many times said that a light shines brighter, uh, the darker that it is. And, Lord, we realize, God, that the day that we're living in, 
is a dark, dark day in a dark, dark world. God, I pray, Lord, that we'd be that light, Lord, that you'd have us to be. God, I pray, Lord, that we might make a difference and, Lord, show some compassion and, Lord, save uh, save others and pull them out of the fire. God, I pray, Lord, be that witness and, Lord, uh, uh, that worker, Lord, that you'd have us to be. God, I just ask, Lord, that you'd be with those that are sin sick or those that are lost and undone especially. God, I pray, Lord, that you'd deal with their hearts accordingly. Lord, show them their lost and dying condition. Show them, Lord, their need for Christ, Lord, before it's too late. As Brother Nicky opened up with this morning, thinking about, Lord, today may be the last day. God, I just ask, Lord, that you'd save that soul, Lord, that's nearest to eternity of hell, Lord, without you. God, I pray, Lord, you'd prick upon their heart, Lord, draw them unto yourself. Lord, let them call on Jesus before it's everlasting too late. Lord, we thank you, Lord, for all that you've done, Lord, in this past year, all that you're going to do, Lord, in this forward year. Lord, we don't know, Lord, what tomorrow holds, but, Lord, we're so thankful, Lord, to know that you hold tomorrow. For it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. The Lord doesn't just hold tomorrow, but he holds all of our tomorrows, doesn't he? And so I'm thankful for that. And so we want to look at this scripture. Um, we started uh, the last Wednesday night that we had, we started... And we read over in Matthew chapter number 9 and uh, some over in, I believe, Mark and Luke and, and then also over in the book of John. And we talked a lot about the work. Uh, we titled the message of now hiring. And, I, you know, I thought about this and thinking about, we, we said a lot of things. I want to flip back to those scriptures just to remind you of them. And thinking about ending this year and going into the new year, there's one thing that I want to excel at. And that's why I want to excel in the work of the Lord. I want to do better. As I, as I look back, and I know you can't dwell on the past and look at the past. The past sometimes I know it will beat you up. But sometimes we look back the last year. And a lot of things we look at the things that we have accomplished in the last year. I, I thank God for that. But then no doubt in our minds we look at a lot of things that we meant to accomplish that we didn't accomplish or in some ways that we could have done better than what we did in the last year. Amen? And so uh, we look at these uh, things in Matthew chapter number 9, verse number 36. You can turn over there if you want to and read these verses with me again. But these were my text verses, and that message then I want to add on and thinking about the work today. But it says, But when he saw the multitude, he was moved with compassion on them, because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep, having no shepherd. Then saith he to his disciples, The harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. And we talked about how that the Lord's working or looking for some people that will just be laborers in his work. And Brother Jimmy mentioned this. I told him, I said, man, he's all over everything I was going to say today. And uh, we said this, I believe, that Wednesday night, but uh, in the day and time that we're living in, you can't find any people who want to labor at anything. You can't find any people who want to work at anything. They're, they're fine with a nice cush job, and a job where they don't have to uh, exert much effort or do much things, and they love a paycheck, but you can't find many people that just want to be laborers in a field. If they wants to be a boss, if they wants to be a chief, amen? Too many chiefs and not enough Indians in the day that we're living in today. And so uh, we think about this, and, and we, we use that, but the laborers are few. And we look over at John chapter number 4, and I want to encourage your hearts again with this. This did something for me that Wednesday night. I didn't have anything of it wrote down, didn't, and, and, and God just, uh, just give it to me while we were preaching that Wednesday night. But in John chapter number 4, in verse number 34, Jesus saith unto them, My meat is to do the will of him that sent me to finish his work. Say not ye that ye are yet four months, that there are yet four months, and then cometh harvest. Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields, for they are white already to harvest. And he that reapeth receiveth wages, and gathereth fruit unto life eternal. Both he that soweth and he that reapeth may that that both he that soweth and he that reapeth may rejoice together. And herein is that same truth: one soweth and another reapeth. I sent you to reap that whereupon you bestow no labor. 
other men labored, and ye are entered into their labors. And we thought about this, and the Lord gave us this thought on us being the Lord's finishing crew. And we realize that we're living in the last days. We realize that we're living in the last hours, the last minutes, however you want to determine it. And we realize that our need, or our, what the Lord wants us to do, and, and just as if our mind is as the mind of Christ, where he says, my meat, or the thing basically that fills me, the thing that drives me, the, the, the very thing that drove the Lord Jesus Christ was doing the will of his Father. He wearied, he thirsted, he hungered, he felt everything that you and I feel today. But yet his need, the very thing, Brother Brian, that he strove to do was to do the will of his Father. And may that will, or may uh, that mind that Christ had be the mind that we have also. And thinking about in the last days of being part of the Lord's finishing crew, God could have chose anybody. I don't know why he chose me to be a preacher during this time. God could have chose anybody to be a deacon. And God could have chose anybody to be a Sunday school teacher. God could have chose anybody to be a church member in this day or, or, or for whatever time. But God has chosen you and I for some reason, for some purpose, to do his will. And so I'm thankful for that. And we think about that problem that we have in today's time. Uh, there's just not a whole lot of people that want to work physically. Uh, we struggle with the same thing in today's time as far as church world goes and the work of the Lord goes. There's not many people that just want to uh, labor. There's a lot of freeloaders. Amen. I guess the best way to put it. Amen. There's a lot of freeloaders. Is that not what the way it was uh, in the Lord Jesus Christ's ministry? I mean, there's people following him around because he fed everybody. And he blessed everybody. And he healed everybody. But man, when things got tough and the Lord said, uh, uh, you know, pick up your cross daily and follow me, that separated those that really wanted to follow him from those that were just really the freeloaders in life. And so we realize that the same thing applies today. I thought about this and talking about the work. Nehemiah. Now, I think I said this when, that Wednesday night and I never got to Nehemiah. Nehemiah is one of my favorite books in the Bible. Nehemiah, I believe, is an inspirational book. Nehemiah is a book of rebuilding. Uh, Nehemiah is a book of, uh, uh, of revival. And Nehemiah is a book of restarting. And I thank God that each and every day of our life, God can give us a new start. I think about this, uh, uh, the phrase that we say oftentimes, it's not how you start, it's how you finish. Amen? I like that. I like that. I, I'm glad that in the forgiveness of sins, in the forgiveness of shortcomings, in the forgiveness of times uh, in my past where I failed to do what God had me to do, I'm glad he's given me today that I may do something for him. Amen? And I'm thankful for the forgiveness of sins of those things that are in my past. Those things are covered by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I want to finish out doing something uh, for the Lord. I want to encourage us as a church to do the same thing. Uh, collectively, uh, as a church, to do the same thing. And, and, and be about the work of the Lord in 2022 in, in, in every day of our life. But in the upcoming year, uh, to encourage our hearts in doing more than what we did last year. I mean, I wonder if we took inventory, not of the thing, not of all the blessings that we have received in the last year because all of us have an abundant list of all the blessings that God has given us. But if we just took into account the things that we did for God last year, what, how long a list that would be, I'm afraid to say, I'm, I'm ashamed to say that it may not be very much. I'm not saying we're a church of a bunch of do-nothings. That's not what I'm saying. But I'm saying this, I believe if we're not careful, we'll slip into a state of just just, uh, just getting on by and just doing our part. I believe I said this this Wednesday night, the work of the Lord is more, is more, it's part of, but it's more than just coming to church on Sunday morning, Wednesday night, amen? Yeah. Amen, help me out there. Yeah. The work of the Lord is, is more, that's a, that's a reasonable service, really the way I look at it. I, I think about the work of the Lord. I think that there is something for all of us to do. We look at Nehemiah. Let me encourage our hearts by this. Nehemiah in verse number 18. 
it describes this work as a good work. It says this in verse number 18, so they strengthen their hands. I want you to notice the unity in this verse. This, now, now listen, this was not, everybody didn't come back at the rebuilding of the temple. Everybody didn't come back with Zerubbabel. Everybody didn't come back with Ezra. Everybody didn't come back with Nehemiah. But thank God there was a remnant of people that wanted to do something for God. What we need in today's time is a remnant of people that simply want to do something for God and go forward with God. So they strengthen. I want you to notice the unity. They strengthen their hands for this good work. Chapter number 4 and verse number 19. I've given you this before. I'll give it to you again. 4 and 19 says this. The work is great and large. Chapter number 6 and verse number 3. I'm doing a great work. Chapter number 6 and verse number 16. For they perceive that this work was wrought of our God. Nehemiah, the book of Nehemiah, and the word of God describes the work of the Lord as this. It's a good work. It's a great work, and it's God's work. Let me, let me say this and thinking about just work in general. You know that God's for people who work? Amen. Somebody help me out there. Work physically. I, I, believe, I believe that God intends on people to work and to labor. And the reason I say that is this. Do you realize that God works? God does work. We, we think about the verse that God works. In mysterious ways, God. But from the beginning, God's always been at work. I thought about this in Genesis chapter number 2. Genesis chapter number 2 and verse number 2. And on the seventh day, God ended his work, which he, which he had made. And he rested on the seventh day from all his work, which he had made. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it because in it he had rested from all his work which God created man. You get on down there to the book of Exodus and it talks about that God has given man six days to perform all of his work. Amen. And to labor six days. But then on the seventh day, that, that, that Sabbath day, uh, we are to rest from our labors. You say, preacher, I understand. I understand that the Sabbath day, is, uh, the, the biblical Sabbath, Sabbath day, is is a Saturday. But we understand uh, through the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, that first day of the week, it is the Lord's day, and that day that's set aside to worship and gather ourselves together. Uh, in, in the work of the Lord, gather ourselves together, not just in the work of the Lord, but in the worship of the Lord, and to rest from all of our labors. I, I believe this. I believe this with all my heart. Some days just become just another day to everybody. Right. Just another day to everybody. I mean, they might do the little church thing, but then they go on and do everything else that they want to do, and really it's no rest, and you wonder why everybody's dragging. You wonder why everybody's, I mean, everybody's laboring and everybody's dragging and, and listen, God ordained it that you had the day of rest. Right. Rest, amen. Take advantage of it. I love, I'm going to be honest, I love a Sunday afternoon now. I love it. I love it. I really do. I love I love a Sunday afternoon of, 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 of sitting around the house. Uh, you know, I always tease and me and Brother Kenny uh, text about and stuff like that. And he texted me the other Sunday evening and he said, You done anything today? I said, Well, I tried to preach <laughs> this morning. I believe this with all my heart, and only preacher I understand this. I believe the man studies and preaches and, and puts all of his being in it. You can preach for, I don't know, Brother Jack, 30, 45 minutes or something like that, and you can feel like you worked an eight hour day. But it's good to rest. It is. Just imagine that preacher that preaches an hour long. Now he feels, don't you feel sorry for him? Bless his heart. Amen. Amen. But listen, there's a work to be done. There's a lot that needs to be done. Do we understand that? I mean, when, when the Lord Jesus Christ tells them to look on the field, uh, they're, they're wide already in the harvest. 
What he's saying there is a lot that needs to be done. And, and no doubt in Nehemiah they felt the same thing. We see here that Nehemiah goes by himself and, and a few other men here. And he views the work that's set before him. He sees the destruction. He sees everything that is wrong. And everything that would cause most people to turn around and say, I'm going back. And I ain't even getting started in on this work. There's just too much to do. But he used that, Brother David. He used the things that he saw with his eyes. The work that needed to be done. And he used that as motivation. He used that for the reason for him to do. There's a lot that needs to be done. But the problem is, just as he talked about the labors of you, the problem is there's just not a whole lot to do what needs to be done. That's why the Lord said from his heart, he said, pray ye therefore, Lord, of the harvest. They, they said, labors into his field. The Lord didn't say we need some, we need some bosses, we need some laborers, we need some people that will work. In this day and time, I see in the book of Nehemiah, I see in chapters number one and two. I'm just going to scan a few things. No way I'll get it all said. I'll probably finish it up on Wednesday night. But in chapters number one and two of Nehemiah. And you know it so well. I First of all, I see a heart for the work. You've got to have a heart for the work. Now, it, it's more than just a preacher up here fussing, spitting, and slobbering and telling everybody they need to work. Same thing on a, on a job. It's more than just a, a, a boss a screaming at you and hollering at you and saying, Brother Luke, that happened to you. Boss screaming, hollering at you, telling you you need to work harder and different things like that. But it, it's more than that. Listen, you got to, in, in working, you got to have a heart for the work. Right. You got to have a heart for it. You got to not only enjoy it, but you have to want to do it. Let me say this you got to want to learn it. Brother well, Jimmy's talking about in Sunday school lesson, everybody wants to start on time. They don't want to. They don't want those trials and, and working your way up and different things like that. Hey, let me, let me say this about just in my job. I didn't know how to build anything whenever I started working building. But you get in there and you have to learn some things. Sometimes you learn things the hard way. Sometimes you have to pull nails, start over again. Sometimes you have to take the saws off of something, cut it out where you made a mistake, different things like that. But as you learn, and as you and as you have a desire, you build upon. You you face hardships. You face things that stump you, and you learn from time and experience what it's like in that work. I say the same thing for us. And I, I, I thought about this this morning. As boy worked with us for for uh, he probably worked for with us for about five years. Good boy. And do anything in the world that you want him to. But you had to tell him exactly what you want him to do. And I, I, we did we did a lot of, seems like this, through the course of those years, we did a lot of roof jobs. And different things, little, little things here and there. A lot of roof jobs and stuff like that. I bet you we probably did 10, 15 rooms. All the same type of shingles. All the same type of rooms. I mean, there wasn't anything. And Brother Curtis, that boy didn't know anything on year five more than what he knew on year one. No, I, because that wasn't what he wanted to do. He didn't want to do that kind of work. He was going to college, and, and he's doing something else. But he was going to college, and he did. He was not interested in that work. If you're not interested, if you do not have a heart for the work of the Lord, you're not going to do anything. Amen. You've got, you got to develop a heart for it. You gotta, you gotta have. We see it in Nehemiah. I, I believe that's why Nehemiah to me is so inspirational. As you see Nehemiah, the work that began in him began in his heart. The work of the Lord that began in him began with a burden that he had. He had a burden for the work of the Lord, and he had a burden for the people around him. When word come in chapter number one that the people and, and not, not, not just the city, but the people and his kinsmen, they were in great affliction because his walls were broken down. We realize that Nehemiah fell on his knees and prayed. And listen, his countenance changed about him. He developed a heart for the work. 
So I see in Nehemiah's chapter number one and two, heart for the work, Nehemiah's burden. I think about this, wherever the Bible tells us for wherever your treasure is, there will your heart be also. If your if, if, if the things that you treasure, uh, I, I guess that's a good question this morning, isn't it? What are the things that you treasure in life? Is it the, the things, the material things? If, 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 if our mind and our treasures are on material things, we know that material things only come through money. So we're going to work our tails off to have money, to have things. Amen. Does that make sense to everybody? It makes sense to me up here. I believe that's right. Amen. To have things. I mean, you, you work, 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 so you can have things. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. As you're working, even though you're laboring, you're thinking about the things that you're going to get by your labors. Amen. And so we realize this. Does that not correspond also or should it not correspond also with the work of the Lord? If where our treasure is, if our treasures are on souls, if our treasures is in the work of the Lord, if our treasures is even being an encouragement to somebody, if our treasures is in, in, in being an encouragement or an example or being faithful or just anything like that. But most importantly, in the work of the Lord, of the, the, the treasures, he that win a souls as wise and, and having a concern and a burden and a compassion for me. If that's where our treasure is, that's where our heart be also. Right. You don't have to, you don't have to fork and gouge and push and prod somebody that's doing what they want to do. And we think about it that our laborers there, we realize that we, the, the harder we work and lay those treasures up in heaven, I believe, I believe the, the sad commentary of most people is they're just simply satisfied with being saved. They don't care about anything. And listen, that's no doubt in my mind the most important thing. But I, I will say this, and, and Hebrews 11 and 6 has stuck out to me for the last months. And he is a rewarder. He is a rewarder. He is. God is. He is a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. He's not just a rewarder in this life, but he's a rewarder also in the generations after that person's life. And I thank God for those things. But listen, I, I need to move on. There's a heart for the work. There's a help. There's help for the work. Second of all, let me say this in chapter number 1, verse number 11, the prayer of thy servant and the prayer of thy servants. And let me say this about Nehemiah. The book of Nehemiah is not about all Nehemiah did. The book of Nehemiah is about what the people did. Amen. The people did. Maybe under the leadership of Nehemiah. But Nehemiah could not have rebuilt the walls by himself. It took everybody. It took everybody doing their part. You get into chapter number three, and you read about all those people that I can't pronounce their names. But you know what? They all had a part in the building of the walls. Everybody has a part. The biggest lie of the devil is you can't do anything. You can't sing. You can't testify. You can't witness to that person. You can't pray. That's the biggest lie of the devil. We got to understand that today, in today's time, same thing as on a job. You got to have help. I love building houses. I know this, I couldn't build a house by myself. Could you? I mean, there's some things you can do by yourself. There's some things you have to do by yourself. But there's a lot of times you need some help in hands right. and doing the work. And I say this about the work of the Lord. It's not just the work that one man did that we read about in Nehemiah. But it's a, about a work that a group of people did. A remnant did. Together, we think about this work 
and the help that he had. And I thought about I thought about this and in, in, in our line of work and, and, and different things like that, but uh, I, I, need, I need to move on. I need to move on. The Lord, there's prayer, there's people. Nehemiah can't and couldn't have done it by himself. We see that Nehemiah prayed. I believe that's a work. I believe that's a work that we all need to be more dedicated to. Is a prayer line. You said, well, prayer shouldn't be work, but prayer is work. Amen. Right. It's good work. Right. And it's great work. And it's godly work. Just like it describes it. But we see here in prayer, but then he also needed people. And we understand that when he come back, uh, he come back and different things like that. In verse number 18 that we read there, kind of our text verse, and I told them of the hand of my God which is upon me. And also the king's word, which he had spoken to me. And they said, they said, they said, let us rise up and build. The, the thought and the encouragement that they had for Nehemiah. And Nehemiah comes and says, this is a work that God's burned my heart with. This is a work that God has sent us to do. And they saw that the hand of God was upon Nehemiah. And they said, they said, let us. It wasn't Nehemiah saying, get up and let's build. But they said, they were encouraged. They said, let us rise up and build. So they strengthened their hands to this good work. The help of the work. And then this is what I really want to focus on this morning anyway. I want to talk about the hindrances of the work. And all that sounds real good and real inspirational, doesn't it? You think about having a heart for the work, and you think about having help in the work. That's real inspiration. Say, so, preacher, that's real inspiration. Well, that's a real encouragement. Well, let me let me uh, let me uh, tell you. Uh, let me burst your bubble real quick. There's going to be hindrances in the work. And uh, if there's one thing that in the book of Nehemiah that stands out to me is his perseverance, even though there were hindrances in the work. Let me say this, all, all that live God in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. We understand this. The minute, the minute you start going further with the Lord, maybe you're here, maybe you're, and, and I hope and trust that you're here and you're saved by the good grace of God. But God's burdened your heart and you say, you know what, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to strive to do better in my prayer life. I'm going to be more faithful to the Lord's house. I'm going to be more faithful to witness to people. I guarantee you this, you're going to have nothing but hardship in your life. Right. I'm telling you. Yeah. The rewards are out of this world for persevering and pressing on. But the minute you start standing up and doing things that God wants you to do, you might as well, and I mean, it's chapter number two and verse number 10. And all of a sudden we have adversaries. Then sent about the Hornite and Tobiah the servant, the Am uh, Ammonite, heard of it, and he grieved them exceedingly. There was come a man to seek the welfare of the children of Israel. I think about this, and I think about uh, these uh, men that were mentioned here. Said they heard of it, and it grieved them. I, I want to I look at these hindrances for just a minute of the work. Every time that you see these men, they're always hearing of things. Verse number 19 to chapter number 2, when Samuel the uh, Hornite and Tobiah the servant, the Ammonite and Geshem the Arabian heard it. Every time you see their path, or their, their names, chapter number 4 and verse number 1, but it come to pass when Samuel heard that we built the wall. Hearsay, hearsay. I underlined a few more, but I didn't mark them. But every time you see these jokers' names, chapter number 6 and verse number 1, out came the past and sent ballot, and Tobiah and Geshem the Arabian, and the rest of our enemies heard that we had built the wall. It grieves their heart to see somebody just trying to do something for God. Right. They wasn't there trying to fight these boys. 
They wasn't there trying to uh, trying to overtake their part. They were just trying to do the work that God had sent them to do. And it grieved them. Let me say this. It grieves the devil. I believe it grieves the devil when he sees somebody trying to do a work for God. I believe it really does. I believe it grieves the devil. Not only does it grieve the devil, but it grieves all the devil's people. All the spiritual wickedness and darkness that we that we struggle with in the day and time that we're living in. That we're living in. It grieves their heart to see anybody that's wanting to step up and do something for God. And for that reason is why most people do not try anymore. Because they've tried it. They've failed adversity and then they've never done it again. Let me say this in perseverance. It's going to take, it, it's going to bring hardship, but it's going to take striving through that together. What I see with not only Nehemiah, but what I see with the people with him is that they strove together through these hindrances. Chapter number four and verse number eight. Chapter number four and and conspired all of them together to come and to fight against Jerusalem and to hinder it. Their motive, their plan, the end of what they wanted to do was to hinder the work of God. I ask you this question this morning. What is it that is hindering you? Is it a person? You know, I've talked to a lot of people about church attendance and stuff like that. And the first thing out of their mind, out of their mouth is this. Well, I know so-and-so goes up there. I wouldn't go to that church because so-and-so goes up there. Well, bless your heart. Maybe rightfully so. But I say this. You're letting a person hinder you in the work of the Lord. There's a lot of people sitting on the couches today that are, have been hindered years ago by somebody that said something. And now all they've done is sung that somebody done me wrong song all the years of their life. <laughs> Amen. I'm, I'm, I'm telling you. I'm tell, I, I don't know everything, but I know that for certain. And somebody has hindered them. Let a person hinder them. Let a problem hinder them. Maybe a family problem. Maybe a problem. I talked to one family one time. He said, well, everything goes right. Me and my family will be there in the church in the morning. I said, you won't be there. He kind of looked at me like, huh? I said, you won't be there. I said, I guarantee you, you wake up on Sunday morning. Something be wrong at the house. Something be wrong with one of the kids. Something be wrong with one of the cars. I'm telling you, the devil works in all kinds of ways to hinder you. Right. Some people say, well, they just got a little problem. And hinder them in the work of the Lord. Talk about these hindrances. And basically the end result is this in verse number 11, chapter number 4. I know I'm, I know I'm scattered. Bear with me. There's little phrases through here that I just want to bring out. But in verse number 11, in chapter number 4, it says, and our adversary said, they shall know, they shall not know, neither see, till we come in the midst among them to slay them. And notice this, to cause the work to cease. So not only is there avenue to hinder it, the devil's avenue to hinder it, but then to make it stop. I'm afraid to say this, but I think a lot of times people have stopped, maybe not stopped coming to church, but stopped in the work of the Lord Witnessing, inviting people to church, being a living, walking, breathing testimony for the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. I'm afraid that some people have stopped that long ago. I don't understand, I don't understand why. I'll say this, it's an easy trap to fall into. And ultimately, that's what the devil wants to do. Hinder you with something, yeah. And then it causes the work to cease in our lives. And so we think about these hindrances. I thought about the hindrances that we see in Nehemiah, they're, they're categorized, I think, in two groups. First of all, there's external hindrances. I believe you put Sam Ballot and Tobiah and Geshem and all them, all them other jokers in there. I believe you put all them. They were external hindrances. They, 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 wasn't, they, wasn't, they wasn't part of, 
uh, of, of the, the remnant that come back, and these are the surrounding, the people in the surrounding areas and the surrounding countries. And let me say this, none of these guys liked each other. You can study it out. None of them. They didn't really, they didn't really jive at the Amorites and all that. They didn't really jive with one another. But man, when God's people come in and start doing something, it's amazing how all them people come together and said, hey, we got to stop this. It just, we can't allow this to happen. Is that not the world that we're living in today? Are you so naive to think? I don't think anybody is. But some people are so naive to think that, oh, they're not wanting to stop the church from doing the church's thing and doing God's work. We're not. I mean, we don't live with our heads in the sand, do we? The article in, on Fox News, it was some, it was a Catholic cardinal or something like that, but he was recommending that uh, all churches, that they would not allow, I guess in the, the, the Catholic religion, I guess the Christmas Eve mass and all that stuff is, is their big hoo-ha for, for the day or for the year or whatever, and, and um but one of the cardinals said that uh, he believed that the churches, the churches in general, should not allow unvaccinated people in their congregation. Hinder, <laughs> hinder, you know. And they just wasn't say, Jesus was all about loving my neighbors, I said, oh, and all that stuff. You think that there's not a fight? And then the world's just looking out for the church's best interest. They're not. They're trying to hinder it. And ultimately, they want it to cease. I guess the question that we need to ask ourselves on these external hindrances, and it goes you know, beyond that. Let, let, me say, let me say this in chapter number 2 and verse number 19. Now, like I said, I know I'm around. I, I, I'm running around everywhere. But I want you to just see a few things here, and I'll be done. These external hindrances, and when Sembalat, the Hornite, and Tobiah, the servant, the Ammonite, and Geshem, the Arabian heard it, notice this, they laughed us to scorn, despised us, and said, What is this thing that you do? Will you rebel against the king? Chapter number four and verse number one. It's come to pass when Sembalat heard that we built the wall, he was wrought, took great indignation, and mocked the Jews. Let me say these external hindrances are full of mockery and making fun of. Right. There are some people today, they don't understand it. They don't, they, they don't understand, they don't understand missionary work. They don't understand giving your tithes and your money to the church for, for the furtherance of the church and the furtherance of the gospel. I mean, they don't understand that. They, they don't understand uh, uh, supporting missionaries and sending your money to uh, different foreign lands and different things like that. They don't understand those things. And a lot of times it begins, these external hindrances begin with this. A lot of young people, I don't know if you've ever uh, experienced it before in your life. I remember uh, being in high school one time and we were talking in class and I said something about being in revival. And there's a, there's a girl, she's a real popular girl there and, and all that stuff there. And she said, revival, revival, you know. This kind of a, this kind of a mock and making fun of. I, I see that. That's the way it started out. These external hindrances of them. It's just kind of making fun of what all these feeble Jews were trying to do. Kind of mocking, making fun of them. Let me say this: People will make fun of you. People will mock and scoff at you. Wonder why it is that you do. People. Uh, let me say this: People take notice of what you do. Right. People take notice of how you live. People take notice of how you walk. People take take notice of how you talk. People take notice of how you conduct yourself. People take notice of the things that you do and the things that you don't do. They understand those things. There may be a little mockery, maybe a, a little bit of laughing, but let me say this: that's part of the work of the Lord, Amen. Doing His will. And so we see this. It starts with mockery. In chapter number four and verse number eight, we see that it intensifies a little bit, and they conspired all them together to come and fight against Jerusalem to hinder it. Nevertheless, we made our prayer unto God uh, and set watch against them day and night because of them. 
So here it goes from mockery to a little bit more intensified. And they come down to fight. And it says here that they conspired all of them together to come and fight against Jerusalem and to hinder it. And so we realize that it then leads into fighting and killing and threatening. And we see these things taking place in our world today. Threats. You can't pray in school. You can't bring your Bible to school. These threats. Let me say this. You can pray in school. Amen. And you can bring your Bible to school. Right. But, you know, a lot of times they start off with all these threats. And they get in people's minds and people's heads. And they, and they make them think, oh, I might be in trouble if I pray. I might be in trouble if I bring my Bible. See how that works. And it causes a hindrance, which causes a cease. We think times past and different things like that where no doubt probably many people are guilty of just letting people railroad uh, over to Christians and tell them what they can and what they can't do. God's given you a perfect law of liberty. Amen. We, live, we still yet live in the greatest nation in this world. The fact of the rights and the liberties that you have to pray. To gather yourselves together. You want to have a prayer meeting at school, you can have a prayer meeting at school. You want to have a Bible club at school, you can have a Bible club at school. You want to pray at school, you can pray at school. You want to read your Bible during, I'm not saying, you know, don't listen during math and read your Bible. I'm just saying, you know, do what you're told, bring your Bible, read your Bible in school, read your Bible in school. But these things are, they threaten and different things like that and we understand that it hinders and then it causes to cease, but then we see on down through here. I, I believe this when the enemies, these external hindrances, see that they just ain't getting anywhere with these people. I, I guess that that's probably what a lot of people say about us, isn't it? Just can't get anywhere with them. They're just hard-headed or whatever they want to call us. But we see here that it gets on down and they try this in chapter number six. I want you to look at chapter number six real quick with me. We'll be done with this. But chapter number six. And I never have noticed this before. Now it came to pass when the seventh valley and took by and guess them, the Arabian, the rest of our friends heard that I built the wall, that there was no breach left therein, though at the time I had not set up the doors upon the gates. Sam Valley and guess them sent to me, saying, Come, let us meet together in some of the villages in the plain of Ono. But they thought to do me mischief. I sent messengers to them saying, I'm doing a great work. Let me say this. Now, here the threatenings cease, subside. And here there's not really mockery or anything like that that, that I can see. But here is the hindrance of compromise. And what they said, I believe, is what a lot of people say today. Verse number two. And some ballot and guess them sent to me. Say, and they didn't say we're gonna kill you or we're gonna we're gonna cut your heads off when you ain't looking. They said, uh, come, let us meet together. Now here's a here's an external hindrance in the work that I think a lot of people don't identify. And I guess what I say in this is kind of puts a Let's agree, let's, let's meet together, and let's agree to disagree. Let's, let's meet together. You, you come down, let's, let's meet, and you, you come down to us. But Nehemiah said, but they thought to do me mischief. And he said this, and I sent messengers unto them, saying, I'm doing a great work so that I cannot come down. Why should I, why should the work cease? while I leave it and come down to you. And I, I think about this. I, I believe if there's an avenue that the world uses today, it's this one right here. And they don't want the work going forward. And they want to do mischief. And they want the work to cease. But they do it all in what looks to be like just trying to help you out. In the book of Ezra, remember they come, they said, hey, we're going to help you build we're going to help you build the temple back. 
He said, you have no part in this work. It's not your work. This is, the, this is God's work. This is God's people's work. It's not a work for all of us to get together in on, and, and on and, and do. But then we see this. And they sent to me four times after this sword. I mean, they were persistent in wanting to have this meeting. Come on, let, 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 us, let us just meet together. Let's, let's, just, let, let's just meet together and talk about things. And he, he said, no, I, I believe every time Nehemiah responds, no, I, why should I leave here and doing God's work right here where I'm at? Why, why should the work cease while I go and just sit down and have coffee and donuts and have, I, I believe with all my heart, a lot of these, and I'm, I'm not throwing off, but a lot of these associations and stuff like that, I believe with all my heart, all them people do is eat. They just have meetings and, and get togethers. They just want to eat all the time and talk about what they need to be doing rather than doing what they should be doing. God help us. And like I said, I, we can fun on them all I want to, but a lot of times we just cease to work ourselves. But he said here, he said, the compromise. Then, then notice this, when he, when, he doesn't, when he doesn't give in to them, then Zimbabwe, his servant, then sent Zimbabwe, his servant, unto me in like manner the fifth time with open letter in his hand. And it says, wherein was written, it is reported among the heathen, and uh, Gashmu saith it, that thou and the Jews think to rebel, for which cause thou buildest the wall, that thou mayest be their king according to these words. And thou hast also appointed the prophets to preach to thee at Jerusalem, saying, There is a king in, Ju in Judah, and now it shall be reported to the king according to these words. Come now, therefore, let us take counsel together. Then I said unto him, saying, There are no such words done as thou sayest, but thou bringest them out of thine own heart. Notice this. I believe that there's anything that hinders people today. Notice verse number nine, underlined in your Bible. For they all made us afraid, saying, their hands shall be weakened from the work, that it be not done. Now therefore, O oh God, strengthen thy hands. Fear, the tactic of fear. The tactic of fear was to cause this, a cease of the work. I guarantee I'm no prophet nor fortune teller or anything like that. But as 2022 comes on, the world's going to use the tactic of fear on doing the work of the Lord, church and otherwise, over and over and over again. And we see here that it says, for they all made us afraid. Now, notice this. Afterwards, I came to the house, verse number 10, and Shemai, the son of Delilah, the son of uh, Medabil, who was shut up, he said, let us meet together in the house of God within the temple. Let us shut the doors of the temple, for they will come to slay thee. Yea, in the night they will come and slay thee. And I said, should a man such as I flee, who is there, that being as I am, will go into the temple to save his life? I will not go in. And lo, I perceived that God had not sent him, but he pronounced this prophecy against me, for Tobiah and Sambalat had hired him. Notice this, verse number 13. Therefore he was he hired, that I should be afraid, and in so do, and sin, and that they might have a matter for evil report, that they might reproach me. My God, think thou upon Tobiah and Sembalat according to their these their works, and upon the prop, prophetess uh, Nadiah and the rest of the prophets that they would have put me in fear. External hindrances. But Ben talked about fear there Wednesday night. And let me say this: if you watch the news just a little bit, not a whole lot, just a little bit. What they're trying to do, they're not threatening the killing of Christians in the work. 
And, 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 and our children and the schools and stuff like that, I mentioned, they're not threatening to kill them or cast them out. But it is to strike fear in the hearts of Christians. The external hindrances. And I thought about this. The external hindrances and the fear cause them to leave the work, hinder the work, stop the work. But it also causes fear. Let me say this. Fear causes people to think irrationally. I've said that a million times over the last little while. You know when 9-11 hit, or 9-11, the, the planes hit the Twin Towers 9-11? You've seen the pictures of people jumping out of those buildings. Now, let, let's just use, I mean, that's an awful, that's an awful situation or whatever. God knows what anybody would do. But let's think about this. No doubt in my mind, those people were afraid. Rather than going down on the building, they thought, I'll just jump out. There's probably a more likelihood that somebody's going to die jumping out of a 50-story building than it is maybe going down with the building. Fear calls them to think irrational. And we think about these things of fear in today's time. Fear thinks, makes people think irrationally. Fear, fear makes people do things that they would not normally do. And Nehemiah said, they were hired that I should be afraid. They wanted to make me afraid. The external hindrances of the world today are trying to strike fear in the hearts of Christians in doing the work of the Lord. Right. I say let's not let that happen. Heads bowed and eyes closed. I appreciate your good attention this morning. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you, Lord, for the reading of your word. Thank you, Lord, for the message, Lord, this morning. You laid upon our heart. God, it feels like, Lord, that we've been scattered. But, Lord, we do feel like, Lord, that it'll be encouragement to us, Lord, to realize. God, the work that we are a part of, the work of the church, the good work, the great work, Lord, it's your work. Lord, I'm so thankful, Lord, to be a little, just a little part in something so big. God, thank you, Lord, for all that you've done for us. Lord, help us, Lord, to uh, be able to identify, uh, Lord, the things, Lord, that hinder us. Lord, we talk about many things today. Some people are hindered by people and some people are hindered by problems. But then some people hinder also by fear. God, I thank you, Lord, that you have not given us uh, the spirit of fear, but sound mind of love. Lord, I thank you, God, for that. Lord, I just ask, Lord, that you would help us, Lord, going forward this year, Lord, to do your work and your will. Lord, help us to do more than what we did last year. And help us, Lord, to look to you, Lord, for leadership and guidance in it all. For it's in Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. I appreciate you doing it.